welcome to the stage Robert Hariri and Rob Wright. So good morning. I'm Rob Wright. I'm the chief editor of Life Science Leader magazine. And uh, the person seated next to me uh, is featured on this August issue of Life Science Leader magazine. And the, I just wanted to tell a quick story, Bob. So the opportunity to interview Bob actually began last year at the CNS Summit. I was back in the green room getting ready to come on stage, and John Nasta says to me, you got to interview Bob Harari. He's so interesting. Now, I get a lot of pitches, and so I kind of filed that one away for a while, and, and then I started looking into Bob's background because John made this comment that Bob is one of the most interesting people you're ever going to meet. And, you know, I get those kind of pitches a lot. But turns out John Nasta for once was right about something. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, because Bob is a jet aviator. He's an MD, PhD. He's founded a couple of different companies in a couple of different industries. Uh, he's published hundreds of articles. He has one of the most valuable patent estates in the world. Uh, about 170 issued and, and granted. You know, the consummate underachiever is, is what we refer to. So, Bob, maybe you could tell us a little bit about what you've been working on. Well, first of all, Rob, I, I want to tell you how grateful I am that you took the interest to, to write that article. I, I enjoyed it, and uh, I can tell you that for the last 25 years, I found, I've found myself in trying to turn living cells into medicines, and I've been fortunate in that the platform of technology that we've been using is all derived from this remarkable organ called the placenta, and we are literally harnessing the natural biological power of that organ to treat different diseases. Some things that occur are very natural. The fact that this organ can control and modulate the immune system is very useful. But it's also a remarkable defense system against things like infectious diseases and cancer, and we're turning that into tools for medicine. So what's interesting, Bob, you're a brain surgeon, if you will. Um, so you got this idea for the placenta. Where did that come from? So. Um, 25 years ago or so, my, uh, my professional life revolved around the treatment of head and spinal cord injuries. And um, we got really, really good at keeping people alive after those injuries, but we were still ineffective at restoring function that was lost as a consequence of those, of those terrible traumatic events. Uh, when stem cells first kind of hit the airwaves as a scientific platform, the concept that you could turn back on regenerative processes that might restore function in the brain intrigued me. Mm -hmm. But I was convinced that for, uh, for these tools to make their way meaningfully into medicine, someone was going to have to turn cells into a product. Mm -hmm. They were going to have to make them reliable, um, uh, highly, highly available, high quality, almost like a pharmaceutical. And I was distressed by the fact that most of the attention was being directed around embryonic stem cells and the cells that could be recovered from the byproducts of an abortion, which I thought you know, were, were flawed. They were biologically flawed, but there were also underlying ethical and moral issues that I felt might be an impediment to progress. And lo and behold, and I tell this story, and you know the story well, Rob, um, I give my oldest daughter credit because when she was in utero and I was a young surgeon at Cornell, I went down to go see the first ultrasound uh, that my wife was going through and uh, I saw this peanut-sized embryo in the uterus with a large organ, the placenta, already developed. As an engineer, it, it, it told me that if the placenta was just a vascular interface between the mother and the developing embryo and fetus, they'd grow at the same rate. The fact that the placenta was already this large organ suggested to me that it was, the, it was the rate limiter or the governor of embryogenesis and fetogenesis, and if so, why? Stem cells plus this observation led me to believe that maybe, this, maybe the placenta was basically a cell factory. Maybe it was responsible for the propagation and differentiation of stem cells. And since it was an abundantly available resource, I decided to go and interrogate leftover placentas, and lo and behold, we found out that they were just chock full of these incredibly valuable cells. So, so when we talked about that before, I mean, when you had this idea, 
um, of this. I, I'm sure you encountered a lot of skepticism, like if it was such a good idea, wouldn't somebody have already thought of it, right? Yeah. So we talked a little bit about that in, in the article, but now that you've been working on this a while, we were talking just yesterday about some of the innovation that we've been seeing taking place, because you've been working on this for 22 years now, right? right. Um, and we were talking about other industries where, and you drew this really interesting analogy I was hoping you would share with the audience of, of aviation, for example. So, you know, um, my, my life, my, my technical life, started out in aviation. You know, I was, you, you know, Rob, when I was a kid, my dream was I was going to leave, leave the streets of New York City and go become an airline pilot. That was my dream. Mm -hmm. So um, along the way, flying military airplanes and, and, and civilian airplanes, um, I, uh, I, I've recognized that that industry has had enormous progress. If you think about it, we went from Kitty Hawk to landing uh, in, on the Sea of Tranquility on the Moon in 66 years. So from flying a kite to, to landing on the moon uh, occurred in, in, in less than a lifespan. Mm -hmm. Yet in medicine, progress takes, in many, many cases, far longer and without the same amplitude of change. Uh, and one of the things which, which it, it dawned on me is that in aviation, um, we use something called a test pilot. So test pilots are people who get in an airplane, fly it to the edge of its envelope, and then decide they're going to take it beyond that. And that's how we went from uh, subsonic to supersonic flight. It's how we went from atmospheric to supra-atmospheric flight. It's why we got to the moon. And one thing about medicine is I've always believed that when physicians and scientists have a personal stake in the particular disease or, or malady they're going after, uh, they seem to move the bar much further along. And so I think that we can learn a lesson in healthcare and medicine by being more personally vested in the, in the outcome of our work. It's one of the reasons why I decided that I've been talking the talk for years and years about stem cells being uh, the next revolution in medicine. I had to walk the walk, and so I'm happy to say that I've actually uh, personally tried the byproduct of placental stem cells on myself, and as a 61-year-old guy, it's a life-changing uh, 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 phenomenon for me. So, so, you know, many of the early scientists did test things on themselves uh, and were rewarded for that effort. So tell, us, tell me a little bit about your experience, because you used to do rugby and all kinds of very yeah. aggressive things, and you, what, your arm couldn't lift it over your head, right? right? So, I mean, you know, you know uh, uh, I, I had a chronic shoulder injury, a torn rotator cuff that plagued me for years and years. Uh, nothing short of a, of a large surgical procedure was prescribed for it, um, but as part of the treatment, I actually went and had placental stem cells injected into my shoulder, and uh, I, I shouldn't have been surprised, but I was very grateful that the, that the effect in a matter of days was complete pain relief and, uh, and restoration of function that I, I probably wouldn't have hoped for even in a surgical procedure. So bottom line is this, you know, is cellular medicine going to be the, uh, the, the magic bullet or the silver bullet? I think cellular medicine is going to become a component of treating many, many diseases. But the, the ability, the amplitude of effect you can get from cellular medicine compared to other approaches clearly, clearly warrants far greater attention and far, far greater access to the general public. Where, where do you kind of see this going uh, in the next five to ten years? So, um, people like John Nasta and I talk about this all the time. You and I have talked about it. Um, if, you, if, I, if I look at the audience right now, uh, m maybe because I've got a lot of gray in my beard and it's become more relevant to me, uh, how many of you out there want to live to 150? Very few hands. How many of you would like to live another 70 years exactly the way you are now? Okay. So, so really, the, the, the question here isn't so much about how many extra years can you add to your lifespan. It's about how can you preserve your performance as long as possible. So the preservation of human performance is a much more rele relevant uh, and, and important 
uh, goal and target for us than just adding years to life. So preservation of human performance. So a couple of things. You want to preserve high performance mobility. Right? The ability to move, get around, be active is essential to health. I think you all know that. Preservation of high performance cognitive function is equally important. The ability to think and perform and compete. And believe it or not, the preservation of youthful aesthetics allows you to be a, a competitive member of a very competitive society around you. And so those three things all can be addressed by some of these approaches we're developing now in regenerative and cellular medicine. So the, in my mind, the future is extremely bright because we know from some of the work of plastic surgeons and dermatologists around the world who figured out that they can inject products into, into aging skin and restore function and, and, and youthful, youthful uh, physical characteristics. That's occurring because by, by restoring the proper cellular uh, uh, population in skin, you get the functional attributes you find in youthful skin. That same thing applies in other organ systems as well. So a, a big part of what I'm very, very interested in is how to reduce what we're doing in the traditional therapeutic applications into broaderly de deployable applications to treat performance. And uh, uh, I think terms like longevity and anti-aging are falling, falling to the wayside because those are thought to be, in some cases, um, uh, not necessarily altruistic objectives, but maintaining performance so that we can all be contributors in society rather than a burden to society, that I think is an objective for all of us. Yeah, I, I agree. The one thing that I found so interesting about talking to Bob is when you start thinking about his, his desire to create a cellular medicine company, and we had talked about all the things that went into when you decide you're going to harvest placentas. I mean, could you walk people through some of the things that you had to think through to, to do that and, and some of the activities you had to do? So when we first discovered that the leftovers of a full-term healthy pregnancy, something that, that hospitals pay to dispose of, uh, could be recovered, could be recovered under very, very controlled conditions uh, where, you're, where you're accessing a lot of the information about the, the parental history behind the, the, the family and the child themselves. That led to us believing that the proper supply chain management from birth to transport of the material to the right kind of laboratory to de uh, uh, derivatizing the organ into cells and biological products, that was a perfect scheme and system to produce therapeutics, therapeutics that were scalable uh, and were of the quality and ultimately could meet the economics of a broadly applicable uh, family of, of products that could treat a range of diseases. So when you think about it, the cost of delivering a, a novel therapy today, you, you, you hear the terms, it takes billions of dollars to, from, the, from the bench to the bedside uh, to commercialization. This is a resource, the leftovers of a full-term healthy pregnancy, that is basically like waste management. And um, I'm very happy to say that 20 years invested, we produce the largest array of therapeutic products in the entire cellular medicine field. And, and, and to do that required patient consent form. Uh, Ab absolutely. So the, so the relationship is established with the donor parents prior to the birth, and then the process of recovering the organ is done in a very orchestrated way in conjunction with the, the, the physician delivering the child. And then the material is, is the custody of the material from birth to manufacturing is, is again, highly controlled under the, under the most rigorous standards. And the end products that are produced are produced to a pharmaceutical-like standard. And, and it also involved going in and talking to a bunch of OBGYNs and getting them to say, okay, so now I have to collect this that I normally threw away. You had to convince them. Uh, you had the logistics, you had to create a lab to store them, and it, it's just, there was so much involved. I'm amazed that you were ever able to get through all of the red tape and hurdles that you had to overcome. You know, th there are clearly bureaucratic barriers uh, to progress, and, and I, not to demean any obstetricians out there, 
a lot of them probably figured, well, why the hell is a neurosurgeon figuring out that this stuff is so good when we see it every day? Um, the, the bottom line is that it's a remarkably powerful biological resource that we just need to take advantage of. So, Bob, you've been working very hard, and I believe in recognizing a job well done. So, uh, <laughs> that, thank you, you, you've earned it. Thank you. My, for my, my carbohydrate target for the thank day. Thank you very much. Thank you.